got a little drag on my vape, take a sip of the old energy drink, and we're going to get started. Web Technologies, this is a long webinar. It should be anyway. It's 20 slides, very in-depth, a lot of stuff to cover. I'm going to breeze through some of this stuff just because if I go too, if I drill down too much on all these topics, we could be here for weeks. These are big topics. I'm trying to give a broad overview and, you know, a sense of, of the topic to somebody who needs to know the basic information. So I'm not going to go real, real, real in depth uh, into any of these things. Anyhow, let's start with the basics. Now, these days, when you're talking about, you know, web technologies, anything to do with the web, you're talking broadly about computing software in the web because everything is obviously linked now. There was a time when these things were indeed separate and programming was thought of as being in a vacuum over here and web servers and web technology was over there and computing was over there and there was these tremendous divides between all these different topics, okay? Over time, everything has been merging and meshing together and as the relevant technologies have changed, as things have progressed, we're seeing less and less and less uh, real stark contrast between, you know, like what goes on in a smartphone and what goes on in a PC and what goes on in a server and what goes on in, frankly, your microwave or your television set. Everything is blending and meshing together into one thing. You're seeing trends now that, you know, there are no more like regional internet trends. There used to be, and there are some left, and I'll give you examples, but regional internet trends used to be huge, right? It was like Craigslist was popular out in California, but on the East Coast, nobody used it. Now everyone in the world uses it. Uh, you know, over in the Philippines, for example, there's a website called Sulit that's very popular. It's like the Filipino eBay slash Craigslist all sort of in one, and it was regional. Now, you know, this, these, sites, these sites are dying down and we're seeing a globalization of the internet. And we're seeing a monopolization, frankly. Big players are now consolidating, buying up everybody that's little. This has been going on for years, but it's kind of in warp drive now where, um, you know, individual e-commerce is no longer a big thing. Everything is consolidating as it's changing. So as the technology has progressed, we've seen a progressive growth in certain key players and death in everybody else. And what this has done is it's, it's morphing and changing things. And it's important to understand what you're looking at is a process that is evolving continuously in a centralized direction. You're, you know, you're looking at technologies that if you describe them individually, they would seem to be diversification. It would seem to look very diversified. But in the reality is most of this diversification has led to consolidation, centralization, and stable franchises instead of disruptive technologies. That's a mouthful. But basically, if you went back to the 90s, those of you who remember it, it was one disruptive technology after another, right? Big companies were all battling it out. You And we were the benefactors of that. We, were, we ended up benefiting huge. But um, when it came to internet, it came to web technologies, there was just one atom bomb after another dropped by company after company after company, all fighting to get on top. Now you're seeing franchises, right? I mean, you have a website, a uh, web service, Netflix, right? That now produces more movies than Hollywood, right? Or close to a huge number of productions. You're seeing that across the boards, like with Amazon crushing away the little players in e-commerce, eBay basically going from a, a used product website, a junk site to like a commercial store in the basement site for all these people who are running relatively large, you know, stores. And What's going on though is as things tend to grow to their outer limits, they burst like bubbles, right? Uh, because once things become monopolized, they stagnate, they ossify, and they die. At least they have in the past. Is that going to happen this time around? Are we going to see ossification and death of the big players? Or is it going to just go on forever like this? I don't know. Right now we're kind of in a doldrums where there's all this ossification, all this centralization, and we're at a point now where you know, it's very important, I think, that individuals, people understand these core technologies. A lot of things have been so simplified and served to you on a platter that they seem, it's like there's a generational gap. Younger people look at this stuff and they see it as second nature. The older people don't understand it. It's kind of only a slice of people in the middle that I think have 
a real understanding of a lot of the technology that's out there because we grew up as it evolved. We didn't grow up on the, the low end where it already existed. We could take things for granted or on the outer limits where this was so new to us, it was astounding and we didn't understand it. It wasn't, so it's not magic. That's the comprehension level I hope to be able to give you guys to where you realize this stuff is not magic. It doesn't, you know, it's not rocket science above your head. It's perfectly comprehensible to an average person to understand all these technologies. And all these technologies are part of a bigger picture, a trend of consolidation and a trend of, uh, on the one hand, it's empowering little guy. On the other hand, it's crushing them. So it's, it's kind of a balancing act, but I think it's important for me to throw it in there before we start. Now, the first thing I want to start with here as a technology concept, something important for everybody on this call and everybody I think that's in our industry to understand is FOSS, free open source software. Because it's something that just your average person has no clue about and yet it powers everything from the Android phone to your refrigerator to probably, you know, your, your car, um, FOSS is everywhere. Okay, and Linux is everywhere. Free open source software has been a huge part of this entire tech revolution really since it began in the 1970s, right? FOSS, uh, Unix started out, out as a free open source operating system. You know, the source code, not free, I should say open source. Uh, the, the operating system was shared with Berkeley. Berkeley developed it. And they had BSD version of Unix, right, became... Uh, kind of a de facto standard in education and, in, and frankly, a part of industry as well. And it disseminated everywhere. And the reason it was so popular was it was open source. Anyone could change it and modify it. Now, I'm not saying average people were modifying software. They never have and they never will. People need to program. But it led to a, a ability to adapt the software to all kinds of different um, projects and to utilize it in all kinds of different ways. Now, BSD, you know, started kind of the ball rolling along with an organization called GNU, G-N-U. And G-N-U is kind of like a weird acronym. It's News Not Unix is what it stands for. It's a strange term. But GNU is an organization, or GNU, that uh, basically releases free software. They started many, many free software projects. And many, much of the software I use each and every day was originated by GNU. And it's out there and it's licensed under the GNU general public license, okay? And it allows uh, individual creators to make software, make modifications and release it, and they're free to do so as long as they release the source code. Now, why does any of this stuff matter to you? Well, an operating system called Linux came along in the 1990s. You had commercial Unix over here that ran on pr mostly proprietary systems, you know, Sun workstations from Sun Microsystems, SGI workstations, IBM systems, Hewlett Packard systems, Digital Equipment Corporation, Alpha systems, and a, and a host of other proprietary systems. They all ran Unix, okay? Windows was never like an industrial strength OS. It was never really used for servers or anything serious, so to speak. Neither was Mac OS. All the servers back then, all the supercomputers, all the uh, environments that you'd find serious computing going on were Unix systems. Linux came along and it was a guy who basically developed an operating system kernel and paired it with GNU software. And this system would allow a person with a PC to install it and completely for free. They didn't have to pay anything. Just download it, get it running on your hardware, and you had a free operating system that you could modify but most importantly, it was an operating system that could be utilized in a similar manner to these big iron systems. You could utilize it to host websites, make servers, make file servers, and do all kinds of things that you could do with Windows, but it was horribly ill-suited to the task. It really wasn't until the year 2000 Windows had any version of it that would be even remotely respectable as a server. So Linux comes along, it gets disseminated, it becomes very popular. It becomes over time, marching forward to the 2000s, the de facto standard for all web servers, just about. I would say it's 90% plus of the market share is Linux. There's also another operating system I have to mention here called FreeBSD. It becomes a standard. Anyway, I'll talk more about operating systems in a second, but what's important for you to understand is you have these, these, this free open source software. 
And it's utilized absolutely all over the place. And it's used for doing all kinds of things, for hosting websites, for running servers, for basically running the entire internet behind the scenes. It's not on your desktop computer, it's on the remote server. And we're gonna talk a lot about it. And the reason for all this popularity is there's no licensing fees, it's incredibly stable. And because it's open source, it is scrutinized by legions of programmers looking for bugs and fixing them, looking for virus threats and fixing them. Is because when you have a server, it has to be virus free. You have a desktop computer, who cares? It ruins your computer, you go buy a new one. Good for Microsoft, bad for you. Now, I'm gonna move on and talk about web browsers for a second here before we go back to operating systems. Another important fundamental concept is what a web browser actually is doing. A lot of people have the idea that the web browser is like a, a window into the internet, right? You look at it as a window, you're looking out. It's not. What it really is, is more like a, a sink. Water comes in and you, and you have water. The internet exists out there on remote servers and your web browser sends a request and what gets sent back and displayed to you is the data of that website. Everything that's happening on the internet, you know, when you think of it as happening remotely is actually happening on your computer in terms of what's being displayed to you at least. Now you do have nowadays server side uh, code which runs on the server, but it's still displaying that data to you. So a web browser is an interpreter of data. Data comes from the internet onto your system and you're being shown that data. It's interpreted in a sense. Now, what this means is different web browsers are going to do this differently. Different web browsers, different results. You're not going to see the same exact thing, not precisely between any of the browsers on my screen here, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, and Internet Explorer. Now they're all supposed to follow something called the W3C standards. W3C is World Wide Web Consortium, right? And it's a organization that was developed to lay down web standards to avoid uh, you know, having all kinds of different internet standards so that there would be incompatibility. Because remember, remember the era the internet came out of, it came out of a time when you had enormous compatibility problems between just Macs and PCs, right? It used to be, I mean, just nothing was compatible, nothing. It was a real mess. So the W3C wanted to avoid that mess occurring online. So at least we'd all be able to browse on the same internet. They came up with standards, they issue those standards, and just about everybody roughly follows those standards, except of course, Microsoft. They uh, do exactly what they want and, it, and IE is always the outlier. And it became so bad, that it is kind of so bad, we don't even test for IE. IE can load whatever the hell it wants, we don't care. We're here to load for the majority of browsers. The majority of browsers are not Internet Explorer. They're Firefox, they're Chrome, they're Safari, there Opera, there's all kinds of different browsers out there. Brave, Dolphin, there's tons of them. They all roughly follow the same standards. Microsoft historically and you know presently too has deviated and done whatever the hell they want. They don't care. So their web browser may see things slightly different. Now, of course, when I say they deviate, they can't deviate tremendously or they'd have huge problems from their users. So they don't. They, but they do deviate to a degree where things will look different. In the past, there's been tremendous deviations from them. Nowadays, we have more than the concern of web browsers, however. We have the concern of mobile. Mobile has exploded since 07. I think in 2007, it was something like 4% of users or 5% were online mobile. I mean, it's a tremendously small figure. And it was people on Blackberries primarily, right? And you remember those, remember when I think it was what, Symbian OS or Simeon OS? And there was, there was Blackberries and there was, you know, just nothing, nothing really. And then all of a sudden the iPhone comes out. And I remember I got my, my silver back. I waited in line. I picked that thing up. I was blown away. I mean, it was like Star Trek. I felt like I was a Trekkie there with my little gadget. You know, you remember the old Star Trek? It was like this super gadget in your hand. Um, what you need to understand about mobile is fundamentally, from a computer science perspective, mobile systems are very similar to desktops. They have, you know, central processing unit, they have RAM, they have storage, they have a screen, they have an input device, you know, there's simplest, there's similarity there. What's different are mobile has display limitations, right? When you're looking at a mobile phone, you're looking at a smartphone, its resolution is much smaller than your screen. 
this leads to UI UX limitations. You know, you can't, uh, you can't load up something as large. You can load up something plenty large, but the text is going to get so small, it's not humanly readable. So you have these UI UX limitations. This leads to the development um, web technology wise. This has led to the evolution of first mobile websites and now responsive sites like we develop here at Rocket Driver. And the, probably the biggest impact for mobile, the two biggest impacts were really the effect on our culture and the effect on business. Uh, culture shock for mobile has been tremendous. And, you know, there are many, many studies that show this. Uh, mobile is leading to, honestly, to neurosis. People are connected 24-7. I mean, I was at a doctor's office last week and you go, go in and there's like 12 people, 11 of them are staring at a smartphone. Um, smartphones have taken over and people are, people's web connection times have increased from a couple hours a day, which was said to be unhealthy, to like eight hours a day or more. And not to mention SMS connected to other people and just all kinds of different things have manifested from it. Importance for businesses, this gives you the ability to market with SMS. This gives you the ability to uh, track customers' habits. This gives you the ability to data harvest, which, you know, deranged as it might be, has really helped business to target ads and go after their consumers much more efficiently. And now after this, I wanna talk about servers. Uh, a lot of people have tremendous misconceptions about servers and I learned this from being a trainer that when I would talk to people, their concept of servers was typically something out of like the movie Tron or uh, you know, war games. They had a 1980s comprehension of what a server was. They thought it was like this giant computer, eight feet tall, you know, that inside it was, it ran on plutonium or something. It's not. Servers are PCs, just like your computer. Um, and what they do is they're just all stacked together in shelves. We call them racks. They're all in little 1U units, just like this. These are 1U units behind me. The 1U units have, except when they're a server, they have you know, obviously a PC, motherboard, memory, hard drive space, et cetera, put into them. And they're stacked up in air-conditioned co-location facilities where they're connected to the internet via usually, you know, uh, they have ethernet from them and then the ethernet from them goes to a switch, which goes to fiber optic. And, you know, then you have different internet connection protocols, OC768, OC1000, et cetera, connections, fiber optic connections that put them online. They often run Linux or FreeBSD, just about always. These things are fundamentally, again, the same as desktops. So mobile is fundamentally the same as a desktop. Servers are also fundamentally the same as a desktop. The days of mainframes and all that are pretty much over. Supercomputing, by the way, today is dominated by cluster technology, where you take tons of PCs, you give them really fast internet connections, and then you link them all together and run them as a batch. Okay, that's generally what your supercomputers are doing today. Now, what exactly runs on this PC that makes it different than your computer at your home when we have a server? What runs on that server that's different? Well, basically, there's, there's four things, right? Number one, it's running a server OS, Linux or FreeBSD, right? Usually Linux. Next, it's running a web server. A web server is basically something that a lot, it's a software that runs on that computer that is designed to respond when you type in a, web, a website's URL and you hit enter on your computer, it goes out, pings the name server, and the name server goes and reaches to that, that server and says, hey, serve the website. Apache web server would be the software that's being pinged to go ahead and to shoot back, you know, all the, all the data to you. And that's just a gross simplification, but it, it pretty much works just like that. So we've got Apache web server. Well, Apache web server requires a database, right? And that's MySQL, that's the de facto. And again, Apache is free open source software. MySQL is free open source software. And the last thing it has to have is PHP. And this is acronym is LAMP. They call, they say, do you know LAMP? That means, do you know Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, LAMP environment. PHP is a scripting language. It became incredibly popular during the ooze. Um, the knots or whatever you want to call the last decade we had um, where people were, you know, where we had to have a language that would hell out for server side scripting to go on server side activity. PHP became the language. And it's also the language used to write most common content management systems like WordPress and Drupal and others. Now, all these servers, 
people ask all the time, you know, there's a, there's a lot of intimidation when it comes to interactivity between, uh, you know, an average person and a server. They have, and it really, it comes down to a lack of familiarity, which breeds a lack of confidence. When you have a server, and it's upline and it's hosted somewhere and you're going to interact with it. You're not interacting with it from like a command line interface typically. Okay, you're typically interacting from, you know, C panel, right? Control panel that's installed on it. Like if you have GoDaddy and you had a server there, you would interact with it in a very, in an abstract manner where you're not going to have to know a tremendous amount of code. But it's way above the level of your average business owner or average user. It's not like it's far out. It's like a car engine. You don't have to be a scientist to change your oil, but you can't go into, you can't just open it up and start working with your fingers and expect to get somewhere. You have to know what you're doing a little bit, but you shouldn't be scared. You shouldn't be scared of servers either. There's always network admins that are handling the administration of servers and typically you can engage with them as well. Now, why is this relevant to you guys? There are going to be cases galore where you're going to have clients, right? Where the client has a website. Let's say their site was built in WordPress and the site's upline and it's sitting somewhere and you have to get access to get into it because you need to get images out of it or something like that. Um, I'm not saying that you should hop in and just jump and do it, but you should know enough to understand that you can because you're going to have a lot of companies and stuff that are going to BS you like crazy about this. I, I really mean it where you're taking away someone's client and they're going to tell you, Oh no, we can't get in that. That's a server. That's a, that, that uses, you know, five protocol internet with, you know, a side dish of, you know, R2D2 bones and, you know, just tell them to, you know, shove it. You can go and you can get access to a server. You can get in there and you can get stuff off. If not, the administrator can. So, just understanding how this works can be helpful. Anyway, next topic here are operating systems. I told you I was going to swing back to this. And the reason I'm going to swing back to this is a lot of you guys don't know, a lot of people when I ask them, they don't know that there are more than just Mac OS and Windows. Lots and lots of people don't know it. You know, how many people on this call really didn't know it or really didn't ever think about different operating systems that are out there? Well, I can tell you what. There are a lot of them. Linux is not actually an operating system. Linux is kind of a blanket term for many operating systems that are built using the Linux kernel and GNU software. So they call it GNU Linux. GNU slash Linux is the proper term. And GNU Linux refers to many operating systems. I'm running on this system right now that you're seeing something called MX Linux. Okay, that's the distribution or operating system I'm running. On the system right next to me, I have Ubuntu Linux running. And on the other system across my house, in the other area where I have my other studio, I have uh, Mint, Linux Mint. I also have Elementary OS, which is another Linux distro. So there's many distributions of Linux. Then there's an operating system. And I'm not covering all OSs by any means. This is like a tiny fraction, but these are kind of the most popular. Is FreeBSD. You know, Amazon runs on FreeBSD. That's right. The whole entire infrastructure of Amazon runs on FreeBSD. Pretty big deal to know that. Pretty big deal to understand that. And BSD, again, is Unix. Now, BSD uh, also uses something called the mock microkernel. That microkernel, or I'm sorry, the Darwin, my Darwin kernel was based off of it, and it's used in Mac OS X. So Mac OS X is related to BSD, and both of them are related to Next Step, which was an OS Steve Jobs made in the late 80s. It's a crazy history. The point is there's other OSs. NetBSD is a BSD version that's designed to install on like nothing. It's the, probably what's running on your refrigerator. If you have a smart refrigerator or if you have even a smart toaster these days, it's probably running NetBSD. OpenBSD is security focused and it runs on a lot of embedded systems like switches and embedded certain routers run on it and things like that. That's another OS. Mac OS X, of course, we're all familiar with that. Windows, we all know what that is. Then there's iOS, runs on your smartphones from Apple. iOS, again, it's, uh, it's based on the, it's based on FreeBSD, it's based on OS X. And you have Android, Android is based on Linux, another OS. And then you have commercial Unix. And I, could, I wrote dead and dying here because it truly is dead and dying. 
Uh, at one point, there were so many different distributions out there, and there still are many of them alive, but they're incredibly shrinking market base because there's just there's no development going on in the big picture, and really they're out there to support legacy systems. And I'm not going to bore you with a list of commercial Unix distributions or operating systems, but there were many, many of them, ranging from AT&T, who was the license holder for a long time, uh, Santa Cruz organization, SGI IRIX, IBM AIX, HPUX, um, True64 from NEC or from DEC. So lots of them out there. Let's talk content management systems. I'll give you a little briefer on that. Uh, you know, CMS systems are basically pieces of software that run on that LAMP environment, that run on a LAMP server, right? We talked about LAMP before. Well, on a LAMP server, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, on that system, you'll install a fifth thing, a CMS. And the CMS takes advantage of the database, PHP, MySQL. It takes advantage of being on Linux. It takes advantage of it, and it does something different. It creates a granular access hierarchy. It creates a system. It's like a piece of software that runs the website in, that's alive. It's not just a dead system. A classical website is a dead static pool, right? You walk up, you request something, and there's a file. The file is index.html. You go to an old site, you'll see it at the top of your browser. It says index.html. That file is just sitting there. Someone created it, put it there, that's it. It loads static, and it loads static content. New sites, they load dynamic content. New sites have blogs so that you can have editors that submit stuff to the blog section and you can have other people that are in a forum writing posts and you can have people above them administrating them to kick trolls off and you can have people working on the front end of the site and the back end and everywhere they all have different access credentials and they're all in that site doing different things and the site is a piece of software and it's a living thing allowing all this to go on in real time that is a cms and there are many different cms systems out there now, from most to probably least popular here of, now I took a, a pick of about five. There are many, many, many CMS systems that have been made, but WordPress is far and away the most popular CMS system that's out there. WordPress started as a blogging platform. It evolved from being blogging and content to being something more design oriented. It became very popular. And it, today, I believe it's 17 or 18% of the internet is WordPress sites, which you'll say that's not much. You're crazy. 17% of the internet is like a thousand times more than second place here. That's enormous when you consider the billions of websites out there. Drupal is another CMS system. It's very popular. It's nowhere near WordPress, but it's probably three or 4%, something like that, but still very popular and a great CMS system. Again, these are both written in PHP. All right. They're written in PHP. They run using Apache and MySQL. And they're different analogous CMS systems. Joomla comes in third place. It's out there. It's another CMS system. And the, now the next two, Django and Plone, are a little bit different. Django and Plone are security-oriented CMS systems. And in the case of Plone, it's kind of a framework, not really a CMS, but it is considered to be a, a CMS of sorts. From different sources, you'll get different opinions. Now, what they do is they don't run on PHP. PHP is a scripting language. They run on Python, which is an interpreted programming language. And I will explain languages in a moment, but for now, understand, these are much more secure. However, they also come with much more complexity to build and to implement, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now, I will take one second and say there are many, many, many different CMS systems that are out there um, your CM, if you go digging and you look for a list of CMS systems, you're going to find huge numbers of commercial CMSs, huge numbers of open source CMSs, and all kinds of obsolete CMSs that are no longer maintained. It's a gigantic list. And what's important is not that you understand and memorize that list, but that you understand the big players because you're going to run into them. All right. You're going to run into WordPress. You'll probably run into Drupal. You may run into Joomla. And if you have like a, a client that's paranoid or into security, you may run into potentially Django or Plone. Big corporate clients like banks and organizations that need an additional level of security sometimes gravitate that way. 
Let's talk about programming and scripting for a minute because this is another area the thing I wanted to dispel. I hope, I hope you guys are catching value or getting value out of this webinar because I know I'm covering a lot of diverse topics. Um, you know, I'm going over a lot of different stuff and some of this ground may be totally boring and irrelevant to some of you. However, I would want to know this stuff if I were you guys. I would want to be up on these topics. So that's why I'm doing this. Anyhow, on programming and scripting front, understand this. You have programs, then you have scripts. Scripts are not programs. Programs are compiled. Scripts are interpreted, right? However, languages like Python, although technically a scripting language, is really more like a programming language. But I'll explain Python. It's kind of the odd man out. Scripting languages, for example, I'm, I'm on a, a Linux system, right? I pull up a prompt. I pull up a, a command prompt and I start writing commands. I can take those commands and I can link them all together. I can pipe them, right? So those commands could be to open up a window and load this application. And then I can write more commands, do this once the app is open and do that, do this and do that. And I can pipe, I can take them and link them all together and then save that file. And now I have a, a shell script. That shell script allows me to, if I execute it, it will carry out whatever the shell script is designed to do. Well, Scripting languages are kind of similar. When you when we talk about them, HTML, right? Hypertext markup language. HTML is a scripting language that basically runs on your browser. Just, just like my commands would be in a shell to the computer, it's commands basically your browser saying, draw this font green, make this font this size, scale this, put this image that's over here and load it here and scale it to this size, put stuff here and there, okay? So it's running, but it's running is predicated upon your browser. It is not a self-contained piece of software unto itself. Scripts need to have an interpreter to run, right? Software which is compiled creates a binary or an executable file. Now, this is really core to understanding the technology because it's core to understanding FOSS itself and the utility of FOSS versus, you know, closed source. When I write a program in C++, C or C++ are the quintessential programming languages. C is what Unix was written in. C and C++ are what basically all operating systems have been written in, or at least in part in, for 30-odd years. Very long time. And when I write a piece of software in C, I'm dealing at a fairly low level. I'm actually writing everything up, and I'm building out a piece of software and I'm giving commands to what's called the compiler. Compiler is a piece of software that takes my humanly readable code and converts it into a binary executable file. So it takes the stuff that I'm writing in a high enough level language to be intelligible and basically converts it into hex, you know, hex and binary. So stuff that you look at it, and there's no way you're gonna read it, right? Now that stuff, those binary executables are compiled through the compiler or my source code, which I write is compiled for a given piece of a given architecture of computer. Like I compile something for windows or I compile it for Mac or I compile it for Linux. Once it's compiled, the binary cannot be used to cannot be modified. You can't take, you know, any, everyone's experienced this. You cannot take a piece of software that's for a Mac, put it into a Windows system and make it run. It's not going to happen because they're written for totally different machines, totally different um, software architectures. So this is, the, this is central to open source. Open source software, right? When you go get Linux, you have not only the binary executable, you also have the source code. So if you don't like something, you can go and change it. You can go and recompile. You can take that piece of software and compile it to run on your Mac or on your PC or on your smartphone or anywhere that you can install it. Now, of course, there's hiccups and technical issues, and this is all theoretical, but broadly speaking, you can do this. Software becomes portable with open source. And also, sneaky things can't hide in the source code, like malware that's spying on you, or you know, ransomware, or viruses, and stuff like that. It can't hide in there. It can hide inside executable files. So, what's important for you to understand is also this. Languages, whether they're scripting or programming languages, right, whether, whether they're high or low level, they're usually designed for a specific purpose. 
right? PHP is written, usually is written for web servers, right? It's written to do web software. Bash is a scripting language written for uh, running terminal co code in Unix and Linux systems. XHTML and XML are web, web software, softwares for building websites. HTML, Java and JavaScript, written for making portable software and web-based software. Python is written for a lot of different reasons. Python's very unique in that it's a, it's a language that is scripting, and yet it also functions like a program. It's incredibly popular and growing like exponentially because Python is used for doing everything from web servers to embedded microcontrollers, building things that you use in electronics, um, controlling you know, major machine systems, et cetera. It does a lot. C and C++, those were languages written basically or created basically to uh, create operating systems way back when. Unix was originally written in it. C Sharp is Microsoft's you know, sort of web-enabled C-based sort of language that's a love-hate with developers. Visual Basic was made for rapid program development. So you'll see this. Languages, and you, when you read about them, they have a specific purpose. Now let's talk about video for a moment. Another technology that's evolved tremendously with the web, and it's very important. Let me just take a drink here. When it comes to video, we have many, many, many formats today versus in the past, you really, had, you really all started off with one or two. Today, when you go to encode a video, if you've ever gone and you've, you've taken a, you've recorded a video and you want to put it on, you have MPEG, you've got AVI, you've got DivX, you've got uh, MOV, you've got all these different options you can pick and all these different encoders you can use. And, these, and the differences, people get very confused when it comes to the differences here. Well, the differences are typically differences in quality, differences in the platform that this originated upon, compatibility, uh, differences in the time it's going to take to encode and differences in, um, you know, professionalism. Sometimes you have formats that people want to get for the compat, not just the compatibility, but because there's software written to accept it. Now, another quick question people have asked me quite a bit is what's SDHD 4K 8K? Basically it's the resolution. SD or standard uh, standard definition is pretty small. It's like your old CRT television, right? Is like SD. You know, it's roughly that level. I think what is it? 1024 by 720, right? Or is that it? Um, the standard definition today. But it used to be for a while when we would talk about that, we would say it's NTSC or, or SD or standard. HD is of course 1024. HD is um, 1080 by 19 or 1920 by 1080. That's, you know, HD monitors, HD. 4K is much, much higher. And I don't off the top of my head, I believe it's 3,900 something by, it's roughly 4,000 across, which is I think where we get the 4K from. And 8K is going to be like 8,000 across. 8K is on the horizon, but it is not here yet. Barely anyone has switched to 4K. WebM video has been an enormous uh, innovation in that you'll go to websites now and you'll see the background is moving. It's alive. It's, something's there. Well, what's there? It's WebM video. WebM was a format. It's freely available out there. It was released specifically to uh, enable creators to build videos and to embed them in websites. And it's been very popular. You see it frequently used nowadays. The main limitation with WebM is people with slower web connections, particularly people who are mobile, can have a tough time with it. Also, slower computers can have a tough time with it. If you're, you know, somebody's running like an old 32-bit computer, they can have issues with it sometimes. And of course, YouTube, Vimeo, Wistia are three enormous places for video content to be warehoused online. I can add to that list as well. Amazon, Amazon Web Services, they have, you know, enormous ability to host video as well. These are very, very popular formats. And, uh, you know, of course, very relevant when you're selling websites and you're selling uh, the technologies that we have. You're going to run into all different types of video and you'll run into clients that need some basic guidance in creating video for their sites. You know, a lot of the mistakes people make are just leaving clients to do what they want when it comes to that. You really need to give them advice like, hey, you know, 
Uh, if you don't have your phone set up right, hold it sideways so that we get widescreen and not something tall, you know, something screwed up. And, uh, you know, just go through things with them. Explain to clients how to operate this stuff and tell them, hey, record in HD. You know, SD is no good. HD is. HD is usable. Anything above that is, you know, more than good. Cloud apps, cloud computing. This is a term that gets thrown around, wow, like crazy. Um, it's a very misunderstood term, believe it or not. A lot of people misunderstand cloud. Cloud is kind of like bu a buzzword. Uh, we've had web-connected software since the 1980s, believe it or not. You can go all the way back to the 1980s, and there was software out there, um, you know, websites that you could, not websites, BBS boards, though, you could log into and you could do shopping and stuff like that. They couldn't pay, but you could shop and you could browse catalogs, and technically you were using cloud there. You know, technically, that was cloud computing. There was software that could dial up and upload the file and sync it you know, as far back as 88, 89. Um, so the term cloud computing really is a newer term for something that's been going on the whole time. And it's just web connected, you know, internet connected software is essentially what it refers to. It references data being warehoused, on, not on the computer locally, but on a server remotely and accessed locally. That's one way that it's referenced. It's also referenced in terms of I uploaded a file to the cloud, just means you uploaded it to a remote server or personal say I logged into the cloud. That just means you logged in usually to a CMS system or, you know, when you guys log in the portal for rocket driver, you're logging into the cloud. So it's not, it's not a term that has, you know, this really complicated deep meaning. Um, it really became a popular term kind of around the year 2000, you started seeing it used and then it took off probably with smartphones. Um, nowadays it kind of refers to apps that run in browsers. That's a very common um, cloud computing application. Like if you run Smartsheets, for example, or Google Docs, you know, you're using a piece of cloud software. Uh, it can also refer to apps that are web connected. It can refer to apps that run from databases that are remote as well, which is data connected, but kind of different. Um, apps that run on smartphones, very typically run remotely and are talked about in terms of the cloud. Now, of course, I'm not going to get into all the cloud's advantages. We already know what those are. You know, uh, the piece of software that I use to make this presentation is connected to the cloud where I can browse and grab templates and graphics and stuff. And I guess I use the cloud to put these graphics into this presentation. So let's move off of that and talk about search. Now, I'm going to cover a topic I've, <clears throat> any of you who know me have heard me say a thousand times, which is that search, the goal of search is to deliver results. And this is where a lot of people get you know, forest from tree syndrome, or maybe it's Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know, but a lot of people don't understand that a search engine is not going to hold still and cooperate with you. No technology is going to hold still and cooperate with you. SEO had a time where it was incredibly, incredibly, incredibly effective. It was a short window of time. It did not last long because, you know, out came the websites applying, you know, with SEO applied and they outranked relevant sites. This was a time when you could type vitamin and you would get um, male enhancement uh, drugs come up on your screen or something like, you know, Oxycontin from Europe.com, you know, or whatever. Some crazy website selling drugs would outrank legitimate websites, legitimate sources of data. So it was, it was a really crappy thing, actually, when SEO dominated. Now, it might have been good for Internet marketers, but... It wasn't going to last and it was bad for all the users. So search engines came out like Google and just kind of crushed it, right? No longer are, and we'll, I'll talk about that in detail for a moment, in a moment, but no longer are search engines um, irrelevance engines. They're relevance engines. The reason for a search engine ex existence is to make money. Search is never going to favor SEO. It's always going to favor pay-per-click. And search again is continually improving. AI has become an enormous part of search empowerment in terms of what's powering search now. And it's not the kind of AI you're thinking about. A lot of people think of AI in terms of, you know, it's a living thing and it's on there and it's going, what is this? You know, take me to your leader and all that. No, this is the kind of AI that is able to do comparisons, is able to say, okay, here's a legit piece of data and here's something that's stolen. And let's compare them and throw the stolen one out. And it does that 
all day long, the, the bots do and the spiders do, they crawl websites, read them, interpret what they've read, and basically derank them if they're illegitimate or have stolen data. Now, I wanted to go into this a little bit deeper because there's SEO. SEO, the old model, what was it like back when SEO was doing great? Well, Google functioned on something called PageRank, okay, where, you know, excuse me, individual pages, you know, had a PR rating, right? Your website was basically ranked on a per page basis. And if a website had high rankings on its pages, it would show up high in the search results. And what people would do is they would take a whole bunch of high page rank websites and link them all together and then link them to a bunch of low rank websites in what they call the link wheel. And this link wheel was basically a whole bunch of sites all linked together. And so a spider would crawl around it and it would increase the domain authority, which would increase page rank, and you would end up with a cluster of ranking websites. And, you know, what mattered a lot less was content because people could steal it, and they routinely did. Number one, image, um, image under, what do you call it, image identification software hadn't really been born back then. It was not, it was really sketchy. There's something called OCR. It's called Optical Character Recognition Systems. Basically, any type of text that you can write on a screen or, you know, you could doodle it on a piece of paper with a crayon all screwed up, OCR is going to identify what you just wrote. OCR, um, they used to, you know, it was modified the same sort of technology to be able to read images. Over time, now, Copies of images are found out, you know, in a nanosecond by the spiders. They see it. They know it's a copy. They know where the first time they saw it was. And that's the place they're going to give credit to. They're not going to give credit to you for a piece of content you stole. Same thing for written content. Plagiarism software, and this is where AI is helping. Plagiarism software was in its infancy. It used to be something that people would do called spin taxing taking a piece of software and running it through another piece of software, taking a piece of content, running it through a piece of software, excuse me guys, running it through a piece of software, and then after they ran it through the software, it would change it. You know, it would go and it would grab synonyms and it would, it would just mutate the text so that what came out was something quasi-original, but it was crap, right? It was like garbage to read it. Because when you take words and you just use a thesaurus and stick in analogous terms and so on, you're not going to get something that's really literary, that's proper in a literary sense. So that went on back then. We used to, and then we had all the sleazy stuff that was going on. It still is going on. People still try it. You see it sometimes. Like remember back then, you know, I'm talking like the early ooze to mid ooze, where you would see every forum was just flooded with bots dropping links. Um, before it got shut down, Yahoo Chat was just literally clogged shut by bots. It's part of why it was shut down. Um, all over the internet, forums, social bookmarks, any open comment section was just, hey, I made $1,000 a week and buy here. It was all crap everywhere. There were social bookmarks like that, form spams like that. It was a broken model. And it became very apparent very quickly with some of the high profile scams that went on, JCPenney, for example, that something had to give, that changes needed to be made, and the new model was basically born. Now, Google rolled out this new model, but Bing followed suit, so did Yahoo, so does everybody else, of essentially putting content right at the heart of SEO. If you have a website that has quality content, if it's written correctly, if it has no spam, no stolen content, so it's not just what you are, it's what you are not. You know, it's like you are, are a good person, but you're also not a criminal. You can be in, in the middle, but if you're, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not, no longer positive or negative. It's positive, neutral, negative. So now we have sites where we're looking at them. We're looking at the traffic they're getting. We're looking at the domain authority based upon the quality content and the traffic. We're looking at the quality of pages. We're looking at, we're looking for proper structures like site maps and image site maps that tell the spider how to read the site. We're looking for all the on-page optimization, alt tags, title tags. We're looking at structures. With all that in place and with a robust social media presence giving you social clout and AI-driven spiders, you now have the modern model. 
And that's how SEO works now. SEO is based upon the quality content and it's based essentially across the boards on relevance. That, that kind of encapsulates in one term everything. If you're relevant, you do stuff properly and you obey the law and you obey play by the rules, with the SEO new model, you can do okay. In the past, you had to break rules to rank because it didn't matter how good you did it properly. If you didn't steal, you're not going to beat the people who are stealing. That was bad. That's gone now. Thank God. And of course, social media. A lot of people have miscomprehensions of what social media is and how it functions. Um, social media sites are basically just gigantic CMS sites that allow users to register and create their own little section and carve it out, allow people to comment there. They're not actually all that complex, theoretically speaking, the complexity comes down to the implementations, but social media sites are just giant data centers. If you were to look at them physically, they're just mega centers of computers all clustered together, running a gigantic content management system. And it's important to understand that the era we're going into now with social media is changing. It's not what it used to be. You remember when social media began, kind of, Kind of the dawning of it really was MySpace. You remember when MySpace became big? I was, you know, I was younger in that time period. I wasn't really on it, but I was younger and people were jumping on there and it was, a, you know, it became a, a trend for a while. And then Facebook came along and eclipsed it. Now there's some complicated reasons why MySpace failed and Facebook won and there's all kinds of conspiracy theories and crazy stuff, but I won't get into any of that. Basically, uh, the social media that you have today for a long, long time, we were seeing new social media sites come out all the time, very relatively frequently and persistently, right up until a few years ago, right? We had different ones emerging, Instagram and Tumblr. And, you know, before that, we had ones like Orkut and High Five and, you know, and, you know Twitter and Facebook and all kinds of new social media sites were emerging. That has slowed down to a trickle and it's even rolled backwards slightly to become a stagnant marketplace. And due to the practices that have gone on, it's become very questionable. You know, they're doing very, you know, if you guys watch the movie, The Great Hack, if you go and check that out over on, um, you know, Netflix, you know, political bias one way or the other, notwithstanding, um, it shows how social media sites are data harvesting and how they're using predictive analytics and essentially spying. Um, to gather information from their users and to sell it. Will there be political action? Will that harm social media going forward? I don't know. But I think it was important to include in this presentation because it's one of the major, major technologies of our time. When we're talking about web technologies that's undergoing some major changes. What will those changes be? I couldn't tell you, but there's certainly going to be some changes. And last but not least, last thing I'm gonna cover in this presentation is artificial intelligence, because this really is the future. This is really something that we've all seen in the last few years explode on the scene, you know, with Amazon's Alexa and with Siri from Apple. And, and you know, we're on the other hand, we have IBM's Watson. There are different AI bots that are out there that are big, huge sort of bots that are designed to be functional and in some way useful. No doubt this is going to grow and grow and grow and no doubt as time passes, we're going to see AI become something much more sort of intrinsically connected to us. We're going to see, you know, as 5G rolls out and the internet of things, and we see those changes go on where, you know, we're, we're constantly on the web, we're on the web through our glasses, through our wristwatches, through um, technologies we interact with and touch and in all these different ways, you're going to see AI play a bigger and bigger role in managing things. Um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Who knows? I know that in, when it comes to things like help desks and bots, it's already here right now and it's evolving, you know, kind of slowly, but you're seeing that evolutionary process not stop. It's just continually plowing ahead. Anyhow, that's going to conclude today's presentation. I will take some questions, however, if you guys have any. Uh, feel free to fire away with your questions. I, uh, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, I'm stopping the share there, and I'll take questions from you guys. Kind of a long presentation, a lot of topics to cover, but uh, 
you know, I thought a lot of this stuff was kind of important just to give you guys some information, give you my take on it. If you guys have any suggestions for webinars you'd like to see topics on, feel free to fire away in the chat. Um, be happy to answer your questions at this time. And if nobody asks a question, we're going to end the webinar. So feel free. You know, don't think, don't be hesitant. Don't be bashful. I know you guys, you're bashful over there. You're, you know, you don't jump in there and just throw your questions out. I know you got questions. So fire away. All right, let's see. Any questions? All right, guys, I'll wait a couple minutes. Nobody asked questions. Let's see here. Let's see, on my last question, Rocket Drive is going to be a one-stop solution between websites and selling marketing solutions for other websites to market their company. Uh, Tom, we're working uh, very hard on rolling out some service expansions of Rocket Driver. We are rolling out some service expansions here, although it's not something we can snap our fingers and make happen really quickly. We are working as hard as we can, you know, behind the scenes to, on that. And uh, relatively soon, we'll have stuff rolled out. But uh, yeah, well, when I think maybe what, what maybe Tom did his webinar, he talked about they're going to be marketing solutions. Yeah, I mean, all of our solutions are designed to help businesses market themselves, I guess. Um, but we're going to roll out solutions like, you know, um, things that will help with social media, things that will help with uh, graphics, perhaps. We're rolling out a suite of services. It's not going to be any one thing. It's going to be a suite of different things that will do a lot for businesses. We are working on that, Tom, very hard. Um, unfortunately, I wish I had more to show to you and more to tell you about it. I wish, you know, we were, you know, we had stuff done, but the nature of the beast is it takes a while to get this stuff out there. Any, and I hope that answers your question, um, you know, to your satisfaction. If, if it doesn't, let me know. Um, you know, I'm certainly here to help you guys. I want everybody to be successful. You know, I'm so proud of you guys. When you guys succeed and you come back and you hit me up and I've seen lots of you have, you know, hey, Jake, I made a sale. I feel happy about that because I feel like maybe in a small way, I helped you through my training to get that sale. Not saying it's mine and I'm not responsible, that's on you. But if I can help you to be successful through my training and through the information I supply you with, you know, that's great. So let me know whatever I can be doing better for you. I am your employee. Please, literally feel that way. Don't just think it's buzzwords. I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here reading from a teleprompter or throwing you a bunch of scripts. I'm not the news media, right? I'll tell you the truth. And, you know, treat me like your employee. Let me know how I can help you. If there's anything that I'm failing you on, let me know that as well. Yes, Sorrel, they're all on YouTube now on Rocket Driver's YouTube channel. We're posting all of our webinars there. So they'll all be there and... Uh, We'll be posting, you know, more and more stuff as uh, time goes on. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to wrap up today's webinar. It was great speaking with all of you. Um, I really look forward to next week's training. Uh, if you have any questions, please hit support. Let us know. Let me know. I'd be happy to uh, create some webinars on topics you'd like or do trainings that you'd like or anything like it. I'll see you guys.